Today, we're back on our Wrangler redo project. We're adding a new front axle, stronger axle shafts, heavy-duty drive shafts, brakes, bumpers, and a winch to finish off the four-wheel drive conversion of our 2007 Wrangler. It's all today here on Truck Tech. Hey guys, welcome to Truck Tech. Well, today we've got our formerly two-wheel drive 07 Jeep Wrangler back in the shop so we can finish up our four-wheel drive conversion. Now, we saved about $3,500 on the purchase price of this thing just because it was the less desirable two-wheel drive version. Now, unless the Jeep you're starting with or working on is a Rubicon, you're more than likely going to be replacing the failure-prone factory front axle anyway if you're setting it up for pretty serious off-road use. So we took some of that $3,500 we saved and invested it in an underdrive crawl box, a factory transfer case, and this thing over here. This is a Curry Rock Jock 44. It's a 100% new, heavy-duty, high-pinion Dana 44 that matches the JK axle width. It features Curry's forged inner seas, 3-inch axle tubes with a wall thickness of 3 eighths of an inch, so bent housings are a thing of the past. It also uses heavy-duty bracketry ready for the rigors of off-road use and the larger and stronger JK ring and pinion. We had them fill this one with a Yukon gear and axle 513 ring and pinion set and an ARB air locker. To finish this thing up, all you got to do is paint it and add our factory steering knuckles. Now, since we only want to paint the bare steel portions of the housing, I'm masking off everything that we don't want painted black. Now for my official professional grade masking paper, or a Scotch Pro Shop Valley, either one. Oh, well, that ought to be good enough. The first thing I did was degrease all the bare metal surfaces. Then I followed that with a few coats of Duplicolor self etching primer. I kind of dig the green, but it doesn't really match up with this project. So, giving it a bath in semi gloss black. See how good my paper towel did. Look at that. And with the axle on jack stands underneath the Jeep, the first thing I'm doing is hooking up the upper control arms, then lowering the Jeep down a little bit and attaching the front shocks. Lift it up, up, up and away. Then after setting both front lower control arms to the same overall length, I attached the flex joint end of the arm to the frame and the rubber bushing end to the axle. The frame end accepted supplied grade 8 hardware, and on the axle end, I used the original factory control arm bolts. All right, next. Then I installed the BDS track bar with the assist of a ratchet strap. I'm just loosely installing it for now. I'll make the final adjustments once the Jeep is back down on the ground. Followed that with the installation of the front coil springs, inclusive of the bump stop extension. Can't get the bump stop in place once the coil spring's on, so don't forget it. Then we install the JKS adjustable sway bar end links once the axle's jacked up into position. And just like the track bar, I'll make final adjustments once this thing's back on the ground. But the goal is to have the arms of the sway bar level or parallel with the ground at ride height. Now, our rock jock axle reuses a lot of the stock outer components, like the steering knuckles and brakes. So we've sandblasted them and painted them black for good looks. Now our Jeep's got about 100,000 miles on it, and it's sitting on 37s, and that's asking a lot out of the unit bearings or hubs. So we went to rockauto.com and picked up a couple of new ones. They had a few different brands at a few different price points. We went with these SKF bearings because they are the original equipment supplier. Now for brakes, we went to EBC and picked up some of their extra duty pads and slotted and dimpled rotors. And the couple of JKs we built on the show in the past were sitting on 35 inch tires, and we got away with using the factory steering linkage. But since this one's going to be sitting on 37s, we figured we ought to upgrade our steering as well. So we went back to Curry and picked up one of their Correct Link steering linkage kits. It's got super heavy duty tie rod ends and 4130 chromoly heat treated steel tubing with an inch and 5 eighths diameter. So needless to say, I don't think strength is going to be an issue on our steering system. 
The steering knuckles get attached to new ball joints that came pressed into our new axle. Then I can install the tie rod, but only tightening down the driver's side knuckle attachment for now. Follow that with the installation of our rebuilt power steering pump that we'll tell you more about later. Then I can install the new drop pitman arm that came in our BDS long arm kit and attach the drag link. Barely sneak it in into position. Then I can tighten everything down at the pitman arm and again at the passenger side knuckle, making sure not to forget that tie rod end. Now to maximize the strength of our Dana 44 front axle, we had a 35 spline air locker installed as opposed to the factory 30 spline diff. So to go with that, we went to Summit Racing and picked up these 35 spline inch and a half diameter 4340 chromoly heat treated G2 front axle shafts. They use the Rubicon stub shaft and the 1350 style Rubicon U-joint that we've added full circle retaining clips to. So these ought to be the perfect match to our 37 inch tires and 513 gears. Now the rear Dana 44 is what uses the 30 spline axle shafts. The front Dana 30 actually uses a 27 spline diff and the Rubicon 44 uses a 32 spline diff. Lots of options and lots to keep up with. Our EBC brakes bolt right on their factory replacements. Now when doing a two to four wheel drive conversion like this, don't forget you need an axle shaft retaining nut. So I've got one on order. Put the brake line up, we'll be good. After the break, we'll make sure our new rear gears are set up right and get our new axle shafts installed. And later, we'll install our new bumpers and winch. Stay tuned. Hey guys, welcome back to Truck Tech, where we're making some progress on our used to be two wheel drive four door Wrangler. Now we've got our front axle complete with 513 gears and an air locker installed along with the steering, suspension and brakes. And all we've got left to do to finish our four wheel drive conversion is to button up this rear axle and add the drive shafts. Now I've already gone through the somewhat tedious procedure of getting a good pattern on our Yukon 513 ring and pinion set. After getting the pinion depth correct, I installed a new crush sleeve from the installation kit and set the pinion bearing preload to between 25 and 30 inch pounds. Now the backlash spec is between six and 10 thousandths. We ended up at about seven and a half, which is perfect. Now our ARB case spreader made setting carrier bearing preload a piece of cake. Now just like the front axle, we're using a 35 spline differential, and here's why. When compared to the factory 30 spline axle shaft, you can see that the G2 axle and gear placer gold shaft is obviously much bigger and much stronger. But before we install this thing, I've got to press on the axle bearing and install the wheel studs. Now, if you don't have access to an overkill hydraulic press like we do, you're gonna to need to take this stuff to a machine shop or a repair facility and have them press the bearings on. These suckers are on tight. And don't forget the axle bearing retainer before you press the bearing on. I hit ours with a coat of black paint just to prevent corrosion. Then I can install the wheel studs, which I add a little red Loctite to before installation. Then I can install the shafts, making sure not to damage any components on installation. One part that can get in the way is the rear ABS sensor, so I removed it to make sure I didn't break it. Then I can tighten down the axle shaft retaining nuts and install the new brakes. But don't forget the stainless steel shims that go in between the new pads and the bracket. We follow that up with the installation of our freshly painted calipers and attach the line. I've got the rear axle just about finished up, but before I add the diff cover and get it all sealed up, I want to make sure I didn't have any installation errors with our air locker and make sure that there's no leaks inside. To do that, ARB's got this cool air locker test gauge to make it an easy job and let us know we're safe to move on. Step one is attaching the air line and snugging down the retaining nut. With that done, you can hook up the gauge and plug it into shop air. After pressurizing the system, close the valve and disconnect the shop supply. Give it about 30 seconds and see if pressure drops. If it doesn't, you know you're good and you can move on. Then we can add some silicone RTV to the diff cover and get this thing buttoned up. We bolt it down using the supplied hardware. And there's no need to over tighten these bolts either. And don't forget to tighten up the drain plug and the fill plug. 
Now we used Tom Woods custom drive shafts on our Hemi Swap JK we built about a year ago. Things worked out great and we had no problems with them. So when picking out drive shafts for this one, the choice was easy. And Tom Woods got us set up with these heavy duty polished and clear coated drive shafts. We've got the single joint at the axle end and the double cardon or CV joint at the transfer case end. And he also hooked us up with drive flanges, two for the transfer case and one for the rear axle that I've already installed. To remove the transfer case yoke, I removed the nut and gave it a few taps from a hammer, but I didn't want to beat on it too hard, so I just threatened it with a three jaw puller and it fell off. Oh. <laughs> Before installing the new flange, I applied some silicone RTV to the splines to make sure fluid doesn't seep out of that connection. Then I added a little Loctite and the retaining nut. Then we can move on to the installation of the drive shaft, hanging it at the axle end and tightening down a couple of the bolts. Then I can attach it to the transfer case using the supplied hardware. Now for the front, it's a yoke instead of a flat flange, designed for a 1350 series U-joint. Same thing, RTV on the splines, thread locker on the threads. Now the front drive shaft has a smaller diameter and that's necessary to clear the exhaust when the suspension is at full droop. Now in addition to controlling clutch engagement and disengagement, up next we'll get our remote controlled winch mounted on our new front bumper. Stick around. Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Now with our air lockers installed and leak tested, all I've got left to do is hook them up to a pressurized air source. For that, we picked up an ARB twin motor high output onboard air compressor that we're gonna use for air locker activation and for inflating tires, which is made a little bit easier with this inflator kit. Now I've already got it mounted and wired up in this kind of unused storage area here in the back. And all I've got left to do is the pretty straightforward task of hooking up the blue plastic airline. Now, if you're in terrain that requires locking differentials, there's always a chance you could get stuck. If you do, you're gonna need one of these. This is a new winch from Warren. It's their Xeon 10S Platinum Edition. It's got a 10,000 pound pull rating, 100 feet of 3 8 thick Spidora synthetic winch rope, and a polished aluminum fair lead, all in a nice sleek package. But one thing you don't see is a manual clutch engagement lever, because that is now controlled via remote. Now, in addition to controlling clutch engagement and disengagement, it controls spool in and spool out, along with a couple of other auxiliary outputs, such as off-road lighting. It also monitors the remote battery, the vehicle's battery, and the winch motor temperature. So if we ever do get stuck, maybe getting unstuck will be a little bit easier and more convenient. Let's get this thing on here. Now, obviously, the reinforced plastic factory bumper isn't a suitable mounting location for a recovery winch. So we're going to be installing a new stubby bull bar. We just have to make a couple of small modifications to the bumper mounting bracket. This notch makes room for our big winch, and this raised lip that I'm cutting off can either be flattened or cut off like we're doing. And that will allow the bumper to sit like it's supposed to. A little bit of spray paint will hopefully keep corrosion at bay. With that done, we can put the bumper into position and start securing it with the eight mounting bolts. Now, since this isn't a full width bumper, it's actually not too heavy, and the textured black powder coat blends in with some of the other parts in the Jeep nicely. Keep these wires, cables from tangling me up too bad. And with the winch wrestled into position, we can attach the positive and negative cables to the side posts of our Optima Yellow Top Deep Cycle battery. Just remember, if you ever need to disconnect the battery, to remove both ground connections. Now, with this being a Deep Cycle battery, it will allow the battery to be drained down from winch use and still recover without affecting the battery's long-term health. And with the winch bolted down, we can install the supplied fair lead. To 
finish things up, we add the supplied hook and secure it with a cotter pin. Hey guys, welcome back to the shop where we're just buttoning up the installation of our Mickey Thompson Metal Series rear bumper. It'll offer up a lot more protection for the trail and the street than the plastic factory bumper would. Plus, it's going to give us a couple of heavy duty recovery points with these D rings. Now, the spare tire, it's not going to fit on the factory tailgate anymore. So, we're either going to have to find a home for it inside the Jeep or we're going to install the optional spare tire carrier. For now, we're going to throw the tires and wheels on this thing, set it on the ground, and see what our newly converted four wheel drive Wrangler looks like. Now, you've seen these bead locks completely assembled, but what we didn't show you is how they went together. Step one is installing a valve stem, which is made easy with this valve stem installer tool that we picked up for just a few bucks. We follow that with a little bit of tire dressing on the inner bead. Just a little bit, help that bead glide over the wheel, help it seat a little bit easier. Now, sometimes it helps to have a second set of hands to help persuade the tire over the wheel. There we go. And once the tire is correctly positioned on the wheel, we can install the outer beadlock flange, along with the 32 washers and all the grade 8 5 16 bolts that were provided with the wheels. And before I break out any electric or air power tools, I'm starting every single bolt by hand to make sure I don't cross thread any of the bolts. One quick check to make sure that the rubber is in the correct recess on the mounting flange and I can start snugging down the bolts using an electric drill with a light clutch setting. After that, I tighten the bolts in a crisscross pattern, working my way up to 20 foot pounds. Then we added air and filled the tire up, seating the inner bead. And that was easy, only took about 10 pounds. Now compared to what we started with, this thing is looking much improved. Now, the KMC beadlock wheels that we picked up from RIMS 1, we've hit with some Duplicolor custom wrap removable coating just for a little bit of fun. Now, we're not done with this project yet. We've still got some cool LED lighting and sound system upgrades, along with trying to squeeze some performance out of this little 3.8 V6. Now, like we mentioned, we made these aluminum wheels red with Duplicolor's custom wrap removable coating. It sprays on like regular paint, but after a few layers build up, it forms a membrane that can be peeled away cleanly without affecting the surface underneath. And if red's not your color, well, they've got a few new options. If you want to go camouflage, they now have woodland brown, forest green, and desert sand. So if you want to temporarily alter the looks of your vehicle for pretty cheap, check out Duplicolor's custom wrap. Now, when we've got a mess in the shop, we typically reach for Scott Blue shop towels. The box has 200 towels in it in an easy to dispense box. They've also got Pro Shop towels, which are solvent resistant and glass towels made specifically for cleaning glass. So if you've got a project coming up or a job that requires you to get greasy and dirty, you might want to pick up some Scott shop towels. Guys, thanks for watching Truck Tech. See you next time.